Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Edward Behrens. I'm the editor of Apollo magazine. Uh, I am joined today, as you can see, not by Willem van Gogh, who was going to join us for this conversation, but very sadly, uh, was, it was taken ill this morning, so he was unable to join us. But we're very lucky to be joined by Emily Gerdinker, the director of the... This is a disaster for English people, because none of us can actually pronounce the artist we're talking about surname. So hey. bear with me on this one. <laughs> so the, the director of the Van Gogh Museum. Uh, and I'm also joined by Lisa Schmidt, who is the curator of the exhibition Choosing Vincent, uh, which is the starting point for this conversation, because I think many people here will feel that they know the story of Vincent's life and how he came to be so highly regarded, but there's uh, a delightful uh, expansion of the terms through this exhibition. Uh, and I wondered if we could plunge straight in and start with why did now feel like the right time to be doing this exhibition? Well, I'll take that. Um, what you may not know, but I hope you will all remember, is that this is our 50th birthday this year. The Van Gogh Museum, I'll pronounce it in the Dutch way, but Van Gogh is fine, Van Gogh is fine, Van Gogh is fine. Uh, but the Van Gogh Museum uh, opened uh, on the 2nd of June, 1973. So uh, on this anniversary year, we really wanted to take a look back to see where we came from and also to talk about who we are as a museum now. Uh, and the story of, obviously, with the largest collection of works by Van Gogh and almost all of his letters, uh, we are the center of expertise on the artist. Uh, but we do more than that. We also uh, work with, uh, have a collection of his contemporaries, and we have documentation, as I said, letters, and we wanted to help use those things that we have to really tell the story of how our museum came about. So it seemed the perfect time to do it. Um, and thanks to the scholars that we have, you know, one of the things we are really, uh, I'm really proud of is that we're a really serious research institution. And research is essential. And it's certainly not boring. Um, and so we wanted to find a way to tell the story and everything we know in a really lively and engaging way. And that resulted in this exhibition, which is the first of three in our anniversary year. We, we are very... Uh, lucky because you just mentioned the word, word boring and, and, and why, when I got uh, the idea to, to, to create this exhibition, uh, usually when you make exhibitions about your own collection history, it's quite difficult to make that into a very engaging exhibition for the greater public. But in our case, we are very lucky that our collection history is such a beautiful family history. So uh, in this exhibition, we used our core collection in the full breadth so not only the super famous Van Gogh paintings, but also like a drawing of a lesser known friend of his, um, letters, uh, objects that uh, come from the private home of his uh, brother and, and his wife, and um, really create a full story of what the family meant and did for Vincent and, and, and his way to recognition and the huge fame he, he has today. So is this a good moment then to actually talk about what the family did? Because I think many people feel that they know the story of Vincent being supported by Theo and sort of how that worked. But so much of the story goes beyond that. So I think now might probably be a good time to talk about Joe. And I... I'm happy to let you just run with this for yes, now. Yes, well... I might put a picture of her up. Yes, you know, that's good. Well, um, actually, we there? should... Oh, it's a strange order. Oh, that's okay. Can you go one further, maybe? That's and one more? There we yes. Go. There because we go. before we move to Yo, um, perhaps not everyone knows about Theo. Theo uh, was the beloved brother and also the best friend of Vincent, and it's really how they regarded uh, one another. I'm using their own words when I'm calling them best friends. Um, he was four years younger than Vincent, and they had a close connection from their early years on. And then when they are teenagers, they both start to work in the art trade of their uncle, um, Vincent when he's 16, and then Theo when he's 15. So they have a very uh, similar early career in which they exchange a lot of 
ideas about what they appreciate in art. And it is in these years that Theo very much looks up to Vincent. And then later on, when Vincent uh, comes to the decision to, to devote his life to becoming an artist, he's 27 at the time, he's very much supported in that decision from day one by his brother Theo. And for the next 10 years, Theo also supports him financially. Um, because Vincent hardly sells anything throughout his artistic career. There are a few exceptions, so he really needs his uh, brother Theo's support. So in many ways, uh, there wouldn't have been a Vincent if there hadn't been a Theo. And I really see them as, a, as, as their, their mission for Vincent's art was in many ways a, really a joint mission of the two brothers. And um, then there's... Jo van Gogh Bonger. I was just going to say about that was one of the things that uh, for me, you know, I came from uh, the old masters and I started at the Van Gogh Museum three years ago. And one of the things that has become so clear to me is that we know so much about their biographies through the letters. And our museum has almost all of them, about 900. And most, most of those letters are in exchange between Theo and Vincent. Uh, and you hear them talk, what, what is so extraordinary is that um, you hear them talk, or you can read them talk about daily things, but also their artistic perceptions, what they're seeing. Theo was in the middle of the avant-garde in Paris, so he really introduced Vincent to all the newest ideas. So it was an exchange on all kinds of levels, mm -hmm. and that comes out so clearly in the letters. And the other thing um, I think is important to realize is that probably Vincent, if he hadn't been such a great artist, he would have been known as a writer. And it's such a rare thing for a visual artist who, you know, their primary language, I think, is and should be visual. So it's quite rare to have an artist who is bilingual, as it were, who can put into words, let alone in such an articulate way. So I think many of you probably know about the letters, but the, 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 the way that they develop their ideas together, I think is, it's, so it wasn't just fin it, financially, it was really important that he had the support, but also intellectually. They also assembled a very important part of our core collection because, of course, there was the work of Vincent, and Vincent would send his, uh, his drawings and paintings to Theo, kind of on his initiative as an exchange for the allowance he would get from Theo. But um, Emily already mentioned it. We also have a collection of Vincent's contemporaries. Um, but this was a collection assembled by Theo and Vincent together. Um, so when, when Theo passes away, there was not only Vincent's art, but also that of his, uh, many of his friends. And up to this very day, we exhibit these contemporaries alongside the paintings and drawings of Van Gogh. And practically every acquisition the museum has made since 1973 has been done in the spirit of the brothers. So you're talking Gauguin, Bernard, I mean, really major names yeah. uh, that they would have acquired or exchanged for right at the, at the source, as it yeah. were. Yeah. So here is the, the strong bond yes. between Theo and Vincent. But Theo also had a beautiful and strong, loving connection to his wife, Jo van Gogh Bonger. Uh, she is uh, from Amsterdam, from a, quite a cultural milieu. And they meet each other through a good friend of Theo, who is her brother. And at first, she's like, mm, I'm not too sure about you. <laughs> so the first, the first time he proposes, she's like, no. But uh, Theo doesn't give up, because he's very much convinced that Jo is, is, is his girl. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's uh, some correspondence. But when they run into each other a few years later, the spark is there after all, and, and they, they get engaged, and they have such uh, a good, loving marriage. Um, and from the get-go, they are engaged for a few months, and then she's living in Amsterdam, and Theo is in, is in Paris, and there's also beautiful correspondence between the two of them. And very early on, Theo tells Jo, I have a brother, his name is Vincent, he's an artist, and he's so important to me. So very early on, Jo realizes that it's kind of a package deal. Uh, so <laughs> with marrying Theo, uh, Vincent, uh, Vincent is, 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 is part of that. There were three in that marriage. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But she is okay with that. Uh, from the get-go, she, she embraced that fact of life. 
And what's quite strange, they get married in April 89. Uh, very soon after that, she, she gets pregnant and, and a son is born. And they name him Vincent. Uh, Vincent van Gogh himself is quite awkward he, about this. I think that's typical for Vincent because he writes to their mother, oh, th why do they name him after me? They should have named him after her father, but no. Theo very much wanted his firstborn son to be named after his favorite brother. But it's only when this little boy is a few months old that Vincent meets Jo and little Vincent for the first time. Uh, and before that, there is uh, quite some correspondence as well between Jo and, and, and Vincent. So they have a very... I could have imagined that since there was such an intense bond between the brothers that Vincent might have been jealous or something because he was quite a difficult man. But no, not at all. He was just 100% happy for his brother that he, that he found love. And even more so, he made the, one of the most gorgeous and best-known paintings for his little nephew. Do we have a slide of it? Mm -hmm. I think so. Probably. I hope so. No, I'm, um, sure, I'm sure you all know the, the, uh, the almond blossoms, the beautiful oh, blues. The blossoms, yes, That's oh. it. The detail we, from we it was um, there we go. made for, uh, to hang uh, over the, his nephew's cot. And it's all about renewal, about birth, about spring. Uh, it has every characteristic that you expect from a fachoch, you know, from the way it has a slightly d strong influence of Japanese art, um, these wonderful brushstrokes. It's one of our great, great treasures. And maybe we'll come back to that um, yes. at the end. So, there's this incredibly close relationship. There's the marriage that many people can only dream of. And then, uh, tragically, yes. Theo dies. Well, first, Vincent dies. Vincent dies in July 1890, uh, and then Theo is left devastated. Um, with his last strength, he organizes a big overview exhibition of the works by Vincent that he has in in, in an apartment of them, that a new apartment that they're about to move into. Um, but as soon as he has realized this presentation of his brother's work. He himself collapses and does not recover from that. Uh, he is actually himself also committed to a, and I should use the right word, not, as, not asylum, an institution, a uh, psychiatric institution in Utrecht. And he dies in January 1891, a week before their son is about to turn one. Um, so Jo only has two, less than two years of happiness with Theo, and here she is, a widow of 28, uh, newly introduced to the cosmopolitan art scene of Paris, m having met so many artists, having met such an interesting brother-in-law with this radically new art that is hardly appreciated at the time. There are only the very, very first little signs of recognition. And then there's a beautiful entry in her diary from a few months later where she writes, I was the happiest woman for about one and a half year, and now I'm left with two tasks from, from my late husband, Theo. The first one is to take good care of little Vincent, and the second one is to take care of the legacy of the other Vincent. Because what is she going to do? Um, there was no will from Theo, so the 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 everything that Theo owns, so that includes everything Vincent created, is half hers, half her little boys, but she takes care of it all until uh, uh, the little boy reaches full age. Is that how you say yeah, it? Yeah. Which is 21. 21, indeed. Yes. So 1911, uh, he would return 21. So that's another 20 years ago where Jo has to take care of the collection. And uh, well, she's a quite young woman and it was definitely not the obvious thing that she would go and do that, but she was very much convinced that she wanted to pursue her husband's dream. And it's what she does for the rest of her life. Um, and and there's, there are some men around her saying, oh, le let me do it, but she does it um, herself. And I think, it's a, I, mean, I think her trajectory is really extraordinary. She was a nice, well-educated, but upper middle class girl from Antwer Amsterdam. She gets dropped into the avant-garde in Montmartre, and she does write about that. She found it incredibly intimidating. And 
she's she has this very intense and must have been very bohemian life, you know, with obviously the third, the Vincent in the background, and then all of a sudden she is she has nothing. Mm -hmm. She has the baby, mm -hmm. and she has all of these artworks. Can you yeah. imagine? She hundreds, yeah, and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds yeah. of works of art, plus yeah. the contemporaries that do. And what does she do? She just instead of throwing up her hands or leaving it to someone else, she makes this her life's work. It's, it's really extraordinary. So there are two strands, mm. really, to this life work. One is promoting Vincent as an artist, the sort of pure art expression yeah. of his career. <laughs> the other is how do you survive? How do you make money? How, and how do you also make sure that the artistic value of these works is recognized in mm -hmm. some monetary form? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm always loath to discuss money and art, but <laughs> sometimes you have to. Yeah. Uh, so can we talk about both of those and how she approached both of them? Because it's quite fascinating. Yeah. She, she kind of, uh, she's learning by doing. So when Vincent passes away, he has uh, just made uh, a, a big ambitious sale of a, of a late painting. And there is a, one of the very few first positive reviews. So there are like the first little, little bits of success. And she's very smart. She moves back to the Netherlands with the collection. And the first thing she does is right away she starts lending work to exhibitions. And at this time it's very small, very forward-thinking avant-garde exhibitions. But she also right away asks artist friends and, and editors like, the Apollos of those days, <laughs> to, will you write about Vincent? Will you write about his art? And that's, that's a very first, very smart first move because... And was this pushing on an open door or was this very hard for her? Like the door was like on a kirche? <laughs> a little crack. Yeah. There was a little <laughs> crack in the door. Um, and from, from, from that moment on you have this, this it starts to the ball starts rolling, yeah. but the, the first years, it's, it, it's quite small, but he, he's on the, the, his art is on the verge of a breakthrough, and, and she did this very smart. So she exhibits, and um, she also sells work, um, and, and we know very well what she sold. We know she had about a little more than 400 paintings from Theo, uh, and, and in the end, in the 25 years, she, she deals with the legacy, she sells about half. And of course, first, the, 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 the amounts she gets for that are, are not very high. Um, but um, throughout the years, around 1900, she really is catching up on, on like getting renowned, so to say. Um, and, and she learns to, to be smarter about negotiating. Um, so when she, she grows more confident about what she's doing, she also becomes tougher uh, when it comes to dealing in, in, in his work. And yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, you know, what's amazing about she did something then. I mean, she was like Vincent, was an autodidact. He taught himself, and she was too. But she did something then that we know, we all know, especially from contemporary art right now, which is she placed the works very strategically. So she sold, she worked with the right dealers who knew where the collections were, she didn't undersell, you know, she, she, as Lisa just said, she was pretty tough on price. She wanted to make it, she, she knew to make it a little difficult to get a hold of the stuff, which put her in control. And, and that, as you know, we see this a lot now, but that was pretty, I mean, pretty amazing that she was able to figure that out. Yeah. And I think one of the most important anecdotes, um, you can help me with this, um, Lisa, is um, the way she dealt with the first version of the sunflowers. Well, yeah, because she, I mean, it's a later, this is a later anecdote, but it's, it's an important one. Um, she had sold her work to the National Gallery in London, and then at a certain point, uh, there was correspondence with the director, and she opted to sell to them that first version of the Sunflowers because she recognized how important it was that that painting should be in a collection of that renown and prestige. So, I mean, this is one of many examples. Yeah of how she did this. In the early 20th century, like when, he, when he became a big name, museum institutions started to show interest, and then yeah. she very much made sure that, uh, well, for the, for the Western European world that is, that all the big museums had an interesting Van Gogh. So, um, so, so she was, in that sense, very good at strategically 
dropping Vincent's <laughs> work around Into the, right the globe, place. but at the same time, she was also very sure about what she did not want to sell. Um, in some instances, this was because she uh, had such a personal connection to a certain work that she always liked a lot, so she just didn't want to part with it. But she also made sure, uh, in, for example, the sunflowers, Vincent painted several versions of different motifs, but she always made sure to keep one. So in the Van Gogh Museum today, we still have one of each of the big motifs, and that was very much a, a deliberate move of Jo. But what she did, she did send these uh, uh, works f to exhibitions, and then you would have the catalog, and then it would say, not for sale, not for sale, not for sale. So you, but that would actually make uh, the so public even more, even more ooh, then I want, <laughs> I want one of those other ones well, that are for sale. So this is interesting to me as well. How aware were, as, as his reputation grew and they became more desirable through the 20th century, how aware was the collector base of the extent of her collection? How much was she having to, f to control the flow, because it's very easy. Do you mean like in numbers? In numbers, because it's uh -huh. so easy to flood a market, especially when mm -hmm. you're new to this game. So she's there being incredibly strategic, getting yeah. all the allure, and also being quite hard-nosed on the individual deal, yeah. but at a sort of strategic level. Yeah. How how did that work for her? I think she would exhibit most of it, so a, 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 a smart dealer could, could figure, figure out the, the 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 number. I think that would be would have been possible. Mm. Um, and she herself organizes a big exhibition at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. That's really one of the the u biggest things she ever did. This is an exhibition that took place in 1905. At the time, you could still. Uh, rent rooms in the Stedelijk Museum and then do your own exhibition there. Uh, so she really was the organizer herself. And this exhibition included almost 500 works by Van Gogh, which is... Can you imagine? <laughs> this had never <laughs> happened before person. and never happened after, and we will never be able, we will never be able <laughs> to, to do that again. Surely to for the 50th anniversary, it. we'll be uniting well, maybe them if you well, We're, we're doing it very last period. We're getting <laughs> almost all of those. Yes. But yeah. yeah. The other thing she did that was a little bit veering off of it, um, she also published the very first edition of his letters, yes. which came out in 1914, which is so early, and that's really interesting. You know, she was herself a translator, and uh, you know, very well versed in literature, and she brought that out, and that, you know, it is really a unique thing to Van Gogh. So that also bolstered his reputation and really helped tell that story. And do you think uh, that, that her role in the letters and publishing them when she did is sort of instrumental in reading Vincent biographically, Absolutely. which is something that he's so Absolutely. keen on? And, and so are there, were it not for Yo, if somebody else had taken a different approach, would we read Vincent differently? I think, I think the timing was important yeah. because soon after Vincent's death, at, um, Theo apparently already mentioned the letters by my brother are so beautiful, they should be published. So again, here there's also like her pursuing her beloved husband's dream. Um, but she was very clear that she wanted Vincent to become known as an artist first. So she wanted to wait uh, for there to be the appreciation of his art before she would publish the letters. Um, regardless, of the timing very soon after his death, um, the, the biographical story has always been important and, and, and the stories about him being a madman um, are also there from almost from the start. Uh, and I think she actually wanted to give uh, a much more nuanced picture and, um, well, it took her a lot of time to, transcribe all the letters. Vincent didn't date most of his letters, so she had to <laughs> figure out the order. And uh, most of the, of the letters we have, about 660 are, are, are from Vincent to Theo. The other letters, she, she did not publish those at that point. But she also uh, kept out bits and pieces that were too personal at the yeah. moment for other people that were still alive. Um, and what I find interesting, she wanted to publish all of it. She didn't want it to be a bloom lacing. Yeah, a selection. A selection. And this 
the first publication was in German and in Dutch, and then the rest of her life she dedicated to creating an English translation because she realized if if I want to create more recognition for Vincent, I have to reach out to the to the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and there was quite a lot of interest by publishers to publish selections. But again, she was very strong-willed, very like, no, I don't want to do it that way. I want to publish it all because you need to get the full picture. Yeah. And I think if someone else had done it, that could have happened like yeah. because it was much easier. Yeah. Um, so at the risk of hurrying this story along too quickly. Yes, I know. So we, we, have, uh, we, have, we have the Stadelick exhibition in 1905, mm -hmm. which is this extraordinary moment. Then not that much later... In 1906, Yo marries Johann Cohen Goschalk, and things. 1901. Is that 1901? I just can't write. That's I all okay. read my writing, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So then she in she has a second marriage. She has a second marriage. Dealer, great. Then in 1911, her son turns 21 and comes into his birthright of the other half of everything that was bequeathed to them. So how does that change things? How does he? Uh, how does he approach the legacy of his uncle? Well, he has a very special upbringing in the sense that he grows up surrounded by the art of his uncle. And on the one hand, this was completely, I yeah, think. that's him, nor yeah. normal for him. Um, but he has his, his mother who is always working with the art and letters of his uncle. And she uh, he hears the stories about his father and uncle. He also read the letters himself. So on the one hand, I think they're like, uh, it was a completely natural for him. Um, and, and throughout the years, his mother starts to include him more in, in what she does and slowly but surely also in the decision making. Apparently he was uh, helping out with the installing of the Stedelijk exhibition in 1905. There's this anecdote that he would go there after school and he was 15 or 16 and he was hanging the paintings so that she really introduced him. But for him it was also always clear that he didn't really want to live off of that reputation of his famous uncle and he really wanted to have a career of his own. And there's a beautiful story. He, he grew up in uh, Bussum and Laren uh, among a lot of artists so a lot of his friends had artistic parents and apparently he and his friends said oh, let's please not do something arty so there was a deliberate decision not to and he chooses to study mechanical engineering in Delft uh, so he becomes an engineer and he has a very successful career of his own quite soon after he graduates he moves to the United States he marries a daughter of Wiebaut um, so politics are also very much a part of the of, of what's happening in the family, and um, so he's more on the background than mm -hmm. his mother was. And in the exhibition, the exhibition is called "Choosing Vincent" because, as a family member up to this very day, like even Willem van Gogh, you you have to relate to that famous ancestor. But how do you do that? How what what? choices do you make in, in, in how you deal with the legacy and, and in his younger years he chooses his own path but it's never a choice of not doing it, he has to do it he's, he's the only um, descendant of his generation and he takes very good care of the collection but um, he doesn't uh, go, go into the limelight Is there a sense uh and please correct me if this is wrong, that uh, Yo is all about getting Vincent out to the world. Yeah. And the engineer is all about solidifying and bringing everything home so that there's a sort of authority. Well, I think he was uh, very much uh, safeguarding it. Yeah. You know, keeping... At a certain point, they decided, and I think they decided jointly, but mostly Yo did to stop selling. Yeah. Well, the, uh, shortly after Yo passed away... The engineer decides, so Yo yeah. sells about half of the paintings and only about 50 drawings, and then she passes away in 1925, and then around 27, the engineer de decides That's it. there's no longer a need to sell, not financially, and also because, well, 
Jove successfully dropped all the Vincent paintings all over the world, and he really makes a decision to keep the rest of it together, which is an amazingly important decision that, for our museum. That's, so that's Basis, what yes. he's all about, is keeping it together. Yeah. Um, and that has, shall I pick it up? That has a, a very important, it's really the reason that we are the museum we are today. Because he, he has his legacy, so you're talking some 200 paintings, more than 400 drawings, you know, really a substantial amount. He has four children, uh, one of whom died in the Second World War. Tragically, he was a resistance fighter. So, you know, he's becoming roughly this age. <laughs> he's getting on in years and decide, then takes also an amazingly important decision. And our exhibition, by the way, is, is around these decision moments. So what would happen if Deo had not decided to support his son? What would have happened if Yo had not decided to make this her life's work? And what if he had decided just to say, okay, my three kids, we'll just split it up and you each take a section and do what you need that's to do. it. Yeah. Which is, you know, we don't have primogeniture in the Netherlands, so that's what would have happened normally. And instead of that, uh, he made uh, a decision to keep the collection together, and there's a fantastically interesting document dated 1962, which was an agreement that was made with the, with the Dutch nation, with the state, in which uh, the entire collection would be kept together and uh, the Netherlands would build a building to house it. And one of the lines I love most about this is that the collection should be cared for and on display there, and it should be, I'll use the Dutch word, levendig, which means lively. So in 1962, the engineer, as we call him, we call him the engineer to distinguish him from his artist uncle, he um, said he already anticipated the kind of museums that we have today. If you think back to the 70s, they were pretty sleepy places for the most part. You know, we were collecting, we were studying, but the kind of uh, um, exhibition making, education things, all the other programming we do now, he, uh, he almost seems like he almost felt it coming. He had a very clear vision about what he wanted the museum to be like. So it was not just, I'm going to safeguard. Well, it's, I've, I've do, they, they handle it differently, but it's the same mission for mother and son. It's both about getting recognition for Vincent, but Jo has done all the hard work in getting it out there, and he <laughs> pursues his mother's and father's uh, dream by keeping the rest of it together, but still showing it to the public. He right. very much wanted to be they're out there f for everyone to enjoy. And then uh, he traveled so much around the world for his work and saw um, American museums that he was very much inspired so by. So this is interesting because I, I was going to say, you know, he's, he starts writing about a foundation, I think, in 1948. So this is something yep. that takes time to develop, yep. that isn't hastily scraped yeah. together. Not at all, yeah. uh, it's really, can I just interrupt? It's really important that he got his three kids on board. Because when you look at it, to go back to that document, yeah. 1962, all three of his children signed that. Yes. And um, I'm here in the place of Willem van Gogh, who is the engineer's oldest great-grandson, whose name officially is also Vincent Willem, by the way. <laughs> we call him Willem because, you know, that would be horrible. Too many <laughs> Too many <Vincents. laughs> Uh, but he, uh, he tells a story about, um, he was really worried about his grandfather, you know, what was going to happen, he was, this great, he, the man always has, had the paintings on the walls at home, and was surrounded by all these things, um, uh, so, so he was kind of worried about how the engineer would react when the museum was finally open, we'll come on to that in a moment, but the other thing he did was that uh, Willem asked his grandfather, can I, I really love that one little drawing, can I have that one thing please? And said no, oh, no. <laughs> not a scrap of paper, not a letter, nothing, no documents, everything stays together. Yeah. And that is of course the the strength of our museum now, and also kept the family from falling apart in a sense, yes. because you know, it pretty, uh, it'd be pretty obvious that there would be fights. <laughs> yes. And uh, and so it was an, he with so much forethought, you know, right? Indeed, from from the 40s right through to the time that the museum opened in 1973, he was engineering this. Yeah. And then at a at a structural level, at a at a larger level, what were the influences on the shape of the foundation? Because obviously. You know, you can you can build a foundation in a bunker so that no light gets to it. You can 
be inspired by bright skyscrapers with lots of glass. You mean the museum building? The museum the itself, and, yeah. and because as, as a, ma a manifestation of this mm. foundation, how did that all come to play? They asked uh, the very renowned Rietveld to do the design, uh, who was at that stage quite uh, uh, reached quite, uh, he was quite old, <laughs> but he was, uh, and already very much renowned, but he was so honored to, to, to be asked to do this, and he very much wanted to do so, and he made the first designs, but quite early on in the process, he passed away, um, and um, then the one who took over also passed away, <laughs> so uh, that kind of slowed down the process a little bit, <laughs> so in the end, it, it, it took uh, 10 years, uh, for the museum to actually open its doors. Um, and, and, well, we always call him the engineer, uh, so people kind of tend to think he was the architect, but he, w he wasn't. But he did have very uh, strong ideas about what he wanted the museum to be like, not only in the sense that it had to be lively, but for which, which meant to him that there should be uh, uh, changing exhibitions next to the permanent collection and that the educational department was also very important for him from the get-go. But also for the building itself, he had very strong uh, ideas and he very much wanted the museum to be a daylight museum. And uh, it's very, that's very different from an artificial light museum. And, and nowadays, um, with everything we know about fading pigments in, in paintings, there is no daylight anymore because we have to protect and preserve the, the collection for future generations. But it was very much de designed as a daylight museum. Then he also uh, didn't want the paintings to be on white walls because he felt it would fall flat. So the walls would have a gray color. And uh, for him, uh, he very much wanted very simple frames. So you, ca you can't imagine more basic frames than the, than the engineer chose. They're like really small little wooden <coughs> frames and that that was it for him yeah. so as a so we established the museum and as a as a leg what's that like as a legacy now to be working with how have what the family did led us to where we are now and how is that to carry forwards yeah so this is one of the most important parts of my job is to interact with uh, with uh, with the family foundation. So he, he, what happened was the whole collection went into the Vincent van Gogh Foundation, uh, and there's a there's a, a board that changes periodically, consisting of three members of the family, one member from each of the three sort of lines of descendants, plus somebody from the Ministry of Culture. And they, uh, they are the formal owners of that core collection. Uh, that having been said, the, the, the whole agreement stipulates that nothing can be sold, so everything will always stay together, which is actually kind of nice because we don't have to worry about deaccessioning. <laughs> in relation to other Dutch museums? Oh, this is very different. Um, just a quick uh, explanation of governance structure of museums like ours. We are a Rijks, Rijks Museum, actually means national museum, and we're one of a group of roughly 30 of these in the Netherlands. Uh, we were privatized in 1995, which means that, to use myself as an example, I'm the director of a foundation, uh, and we receive some subsidy from the Ministry of Culture here. In our case, very little. Only 10% of our income comes directly from the Dutch state. Uh, and then, but what's unusual here is that we, I have this very important link with the Vincent van Gogh Foundation, so I'll call it the Family Foundation for short. Um, so, to give you some practical examples, we get loan requests practically daily. <laughs> People want to borrow our fabulous work, and we do our best to support our colleagues. Um, we, as the art historians, as the museum people, make an assessment. Is it, a, is it a, an exhibition we think we should lend to? Is the painting, as it often is, um, safe to travel? And then we make a recommendation to the family who subsequently actually take the final decision. Um, it's also important that uh, the line that we take as a museum, so the strategic direction we take, is that they have a good feeling about that. So it's, an, it's, it's a fascinating interaction. I'm happy to say, and this is not just because we're on camera, it's a really great interaction at the moment. 
uh, I learn a lot from them, from their sense of their history, from their pride in what their grandfather and, and great grandmother did. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's important that they feel good about the way that we're going. And, and so I have to say, and it wasn't always great. Sometimes, you know, like every family, there are rocky patches <laughs> and complicated things. But I have to say at the moment, uh, it's, it's really going extremely well. And that is also, when you ask me why are we doing this exhibition, we're starting to come into a new generation. The current... Um, chairman of uh, the Vincent Fajol Foundation is the next generation now. Yeah. She's the youngest generation. She's also fantastically photogenic and extremely intelligent and speaks beautifully, so it's a joy to work with her. Um, but they, I think, are at a moment now where they feel like the story, the family story, is ripe enough to be told. If, if I can uh, add one, oh. one little thing to that. Um, I think it's what I think is important that the, as an institution, the museum does have the lead, mm. as in we are, they are not demanding from us that we should do research on this or that. So they have very much faith and trust in us, in, in our research and curatorials and conservators. To, to, to we have all the freedom, uh, not only in the way the directions our research are taken, but also when we make acquisitions. So. Yeah, uh, I, I, like, I, I think so that's that important. trust space is really important. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, I think maybe another ingredient is uh, you're asking uh, quite right a lot of questions about Yo Boomer. Um, we know a lot more about this now because one of our colleagues, whose name is Hans Lauten, wrote the most fantastic biography. It's uh, just come out in English. Yes. Uh, I recommend all of you go in. It's quite a thick book, but it's a great read. <laughs> um, very well documented. And that came out a few years ago. Yeah. So, um, and I also, as I said at the top, we, I think it's really important that everyone understands we are not only a great museum with wonderful exhibitions, but we're also really a formidable research institution. And we can do these projects and think it's important to continue to do them. So Hans's book just came out. Oh, actually, another colleague is now working on a biography about the engineer. So who knows? The Maybe picture. there's going to be... Yes, yeah. we can do this in five years' time. Yeah. No, but it's so much fun that, that I've, I, I've worked quite a few years at the museum, but to realize with a project that is so much focused on your core collection and you have so many new things to tell. It's amazing. You cannot, there's, there's always n new stories to unravel, and that's such a joy. I mean, I think that's probably the moment where we should wrap this up for a second. So may I thank very much Lisa and Emily for joining me to discuss Becoming Vincent. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for the invitation.